I am an embalmer, and I will tell you my terrifying experiences at the funeral home. Some of the stories you are about to hear may disturb you greatly. I recommend that if you ever feel uncomfortable or if fear starts to overwhelm you, it's better to come back another time. Malevolent entities will use your own fear against you, and this might be your first encounter with spirits that won't let you live in peace for a long time. If you decide to leave, it would help me a lot if you leave a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Usually, when we talk about death, we experience a range of emotions. Some get goosebumps, others are simply afraid, and some outright avoid the topic or leave the place. But very rarely do we hear from those who work with those who have passed away, doctors or forensic specialists who have experienced more than supernatural and completely terrifying situations. How difficult it is to see or recognize and amorgue the person who accompanied you throughout your life or a significant part of it. If that is chilling, I must warn you that what you are about to hear goes far beyond the bounds of understanding. Moreover, these are completely real experiences that we recently investigated. Are you ready for this? Anonymous I prefer to remain anonymous because the information I'm about to share is not commonly discussed due to the difficulty of the subject. I have taken the liberty of writing to talk a bit about some of the things I've experienced as an embalmer, or as they're called now, in these times, I work as the urban subdirector of the Forensic Medical Service, SEMEFO, or Public Morgues, and I also manage my own funeral home. It's a family business that started with my grandparents, and it's where I learned how to work with the deceased, practices that aren't found in any forensic medicine textbook. I also want to share with you the worst mistake of my life, something I would strongly advise against doing in your line of work, as it could lead to the scare of your life and, worse yet, bring that entity into your home. It's the most shocking thing I've experienced because my little ones were involved, and it was very difficult to get out of that situation. I'll explain why later. I started in this profession around the age of 13, when I had enough strength to carry and handle people. As far back as I can remember, I saw my father and grandfather working with the deceased. You might think I'm completely used to this or, colloquially, I'm fearless, but I'm not. This job is truly unpredictable, each person is different, and there have been situations that are very sad or completely and terrifyingly violent. More than horror stories or tales of horror, these are experiences that have marked me forever. This is where I question and can almost affirm that there is life after leaving this earthly world. Not only that, but we have the possibility to return to accompany the people we love the most or to protect them from all those demonic entities that also exist and are always lurking or harming someone through some kind of witchcraft or because they can't move on due to being strongly bound by some dark work. For a while, I was a gravedigger and responsible for a municipal cemetery. To give you a taste of what's to come and to prove that what I'm telling you is real, I'll tell you what happened to me. I was around 28 years old when, due to circumstances in my life and the connections I have in the public sphere, I was offered the position of administrator or manager of the municipal cemetery in my area. It would only be for one administration, about three years, but during that time, I was drawn in deeply. I mentioned witchcraft because, at one point, many graves were unearthed, and what they all had in common was that their skulls were missing. I don't know about those kinds of rituals, but what I can assure you is what happened afterward. I firmly believe that cemeteries are places of rest, sites that serve as a final resting place, and above all, places filled with energy. As the father of chemistry said, energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed. From this event, there was an arrest, and I really enjoy discussing these unknown or terrifying topics for many. I work very closely with death, which is why it interests me. That night, with the help of the security guards, we had captured a supposed witch who I imagine had become accustomed to coming for his merchandise. It hadn't been long since I arrived to put that place in order, and of course, I would gain some points by handing him over to the authorities because, honestly, more than an administrative offense, it's about messing with the families who have entrusted their loved ones to that place. When that person arrived at my office, their hands were covered in dirt and who knows what else. They carried a backpack that contained the evidence of what I'm telling you. On top of everything, there was a skull full of remains, but what surprised me greatly was when they pulled out the second one. 
I don't know how they had the courage to dig up another one, but this one was still intact. It looked as if the person had been buried just days ago. Their features, skin, and even hair were very well preserved. We were all surprised because this was clearly not normal. Due to the age of the cemetery, it used to be common practice to bury people close to the surface. I remember my grandfather used to prepare bodies back in those days with just formaldehyde and lime. Some were wrapped in blankets, and those who had the privilege of a coffin used it. It was in those old graves that this person took advantage to scratch and retrieve what they needed. We called the relevant authorities, and before they arrived, I had a chance to talk to this servant of the malevolent. Supposedly, by letting him go, he could reward me with wealth and many more things through black magic, but I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to know why he was doing it, so I asked directly without hesitation. He told me that when a person passes away, they can be summoned to carry out some rather chilling tasks, from watching over someone, disturbing them, or causing them great harm, just so that they can rest in peace, which never happens because they never return what they've taken to their place of origin. I heard of a very similar case that happened many years later when I already had my own family, and I was working as a forensic expert. I imagine that, as in many jobs, people form relationships, and sometimes, it's not for the better. I had a friend who decided to get involved with a colleague despite being married. Sometimes, the human mind is so twisted that it easily surpasses fiction. The time came when this relationship became unsustainable. We all had already realized what was happening, and above all, that it wasn't worth it. After some time, they broke up, and that's when the problems began. As was customary in our office, we would sometimes eat together, order food, or simply bring our own containers to heat our meals. It was one of those days that things changed for my colleague. My colleague really liked chocolate, and this woman didn't miss the opportunity. Before saying goodbye and leaving because her professional duties were over, she left a small but significant detail for my colleague, a clown lollipop accompanied by other candies that no one would have imagined were worked with the darkest witchcraft I've ever known. He found it very easy to eat the candies and take the rest home, including the chocolate lollipop. Minutes later, one of his twins ate it, and days later, the torment began for everyone. In the next payday, my former colleague mentioned that they went to a park to have some fun, but one of their children was acting very strangely. The child said it was hard to walk and felt very tired. It was clear that playing was a struggle, so they ended up going back home and took the child to the doctor the next day to see what was wrong. The doctor diagnosed the child as perfectly normal and completely healthy because there were no symptoms related to any illness. This was very strange because the child kept saying they felt worse each time. It wasn't until one night when the child ran out of their room and almost crawled because they said they couldn't get up and that something was on top of them. That's when they became extremely concerned because this wasn't normal at all. They changed the doctor, but they were told the same thing. His health was excellent according to the tests. However, one thing they noticed was that when they weighed the child, the numbers didn't add up. The doctor thought his scale was broken and borrowed the one from his neighbor to see if this time they could record the child's weight correctly. They were in for a big surprise when both scales matched. They showed the same weight. I can't recall how many extra kilos the child had gained, but it didn't match the weight of a child. All of this was no longer a natural matter. The elders in the families often know many things from experience. It was the child's mother who suggested they take him for a spiritual cleansing because what the child was saying often frightened even his own parents. That's when they learned what had happened. Even though the witch they consulted had already figured out the causes and what was affecting the child, she didn't want to expose my colleague and simply mentioned that, indeed, the child was carrying a deceased person, and if he wasn't set free, he would take the child with him, as that was his mission, to destroy him. They performed some liberation rituals and managed to help the child. I bring up this little story because of what I told you about the cemetery. They used the deceased to carry out completely terrifying tasks. What fault did the child have? And why did my friend go looking for what he already had at home? Delicate situations like that are what the sorcerer we detained that early morning was handling. Many say that when you're in that place, it's only for rest, but that's not the case. Many bad people can bring you back for completely terrifying things.
My first experience with the paranormal while working and assisting at the funeral home was a completely terrifying one. It is known that in very strange situations, the dead return from the beyond, even after they have passed away just a few hours before. I hope that my colleagues in the same profession can corroborate this anecdote. I was around 16 years old when we received a service request. My grandfather's funeral home, which is now mine and where I currently work, was in high demand in those years because very few people in our area were dedicated to working with the deceased. The gentleman we had to pick up was already at his home because, as his wife and children explained, they had found him in the middle of the cornfield. In their home, it was customary for them to go to the fields very early in the morning with just a cup of coffee in their stomachs, sometimes accompanied by some biscuits. After a hard day's work, they would return around noon to eat and rest a bit because they had to go back to tend to the calves and milk the cows very early the next day. That day, the husband didn't return for lunch, so his wife sent their eldest son to tell him that the meal was ready. That's when they realized what had happened. Her husband was found in the cornfield, completely unconscious, under a sack of corn that he seemed to be carrying when the unfortunate event occurred. Without a second thought, their son harnessed the oxen and prepared them for the cart to bring his father home. He took the lifeless body and placed it in the cart. When he arrived home, you can imagine the shock of the lady when she saw her son coming in with his father in his arms, a scene that was utterly heart-wrenching. In the past, when families lacked resources, it was common to only wash the body, shave it, dress it in clothes provided by the family, make it look as presentable as possible, and place it in a coffin so that it could be viewed, and the following day, it could be buried either in the municipal cemetery or in the area designated by the community. Since there were no preparations like there are today, all we did was bring everything we needed to prepare the deceased to their own home. After finishing the service, we placed a large block of ice in an aluminum tub, accompanied by some sliced onions. This helped mask the foul odors and the huge block of ice slowed down the decomposition a little. After making our client immaculate, we placed them in their coffin and returned to the funeral home to take care of other pending tasks. Since those times when families lacked resources, my grandfather and father taught us to be more humane with people going through this difficult situation. So, that night, my grandfather boiled some coffee grounds, and around 11 p.m., he sent me to deliver it to my cousins, who also worked with my grandfather. We arrived at the lady's house, and you can imagine how disturbing the situation was, people crying, some sad, and others recalling events they had experienced with the person who was now in a wooden box. That's what I remember before I tell you what happened. We delivered the coffee, and the lady of the house kindly asked us to leave it in the kitchen. She thanked us profusely, and we walked away. The houses in the ranches are very long, and you have to go almost all the way through the house to reach the kitchen or the bathroom. This was a construction custom of that time. I'm also human, and I also feel fear, especially when I was just starting in this job of helping the deceased so that their families could have a good memory despite how difficult their departure might have been. We left the big pot on that wooden table, turned off the lights, and walked back to the entrance where the client was being viewed. We were saying our goodbyes when a gut-wrenching scream caught the attention of everyone there. When I turned around, I saw that the person we had placed in the coffin just a few hours ago was starting to reach out with their hands from the casket and was trying to get out of it. My legs and body couldn't take it anymore, and when the deceased suddenly sat up and gasped for breath as if they were struggling for air or were in agony, I passed out. I woke up drenched in sweat because my cousins were trying to wake me up. I sat up and started screaming as soon as I saw the deceased person sitting there, breathing heavily, as if they were gasping for air or in their last moments of agony. That man was fighting death. Immediately, one of my cousins, upon seeing me awake, ran to our funeral home, which was my grandfather's house at the time, and told him what was happening. My cousin said my grandfather jumped out of bed like a spring, put on his shoes, and came to the house of the man who had just returned from the beyond. Between his eldest son and my grandfather, they took him to his bed, laid him down, and my grandfather told him that he couldn't go yet. He asked his wife to tell him that everything would be fine, that he could leave and not worry about anything, that they would find a way to get by, and that he could go without any worries. Minutes later, the man passed away and never returned. 
I understand perfectly well that night, no one returned to the wake because of the shock and the experience they had lived through. My grandfather sent for my father, and we stayed with that family all night. It was very impressive for me to witness the strength and composure with which my grandfather and father handled that man's return from the beyond and his second departure. That was my welcome to the funeral world, if you can call it that. Over the years, I've experienced many paranormal incidents, but few have scared me or made me scream like that night. These are events for which, to this day, I haven't found any logical explanation. Another quite terrifying event happened when I was a bit older. I don't know if you've heard conversations where people say, she just didn't want to go. Well, in some cases, individuals who have left this world don't want to move on to the other side and do everything they can to stay here at all costs. In 98, a highly publicized incident occurred in the newspapers of my state. A taxi had collided with a bus, and unfortunately, the people in the small car have lost their lives instantly. The mother of the young woman who was in the taxi was a neighbor from our municipality, and she came to us to carry out the service. I had good relations with the prosecutor's office and the public ministries, which are the ones that handle these cases. I managed to retrieve her daughter promptly because sometimes these types of cases can be a bit delayed, and families become very desperate when they can't be with their deceased loved ones. We took her to the funeral home to do our work. We placed her on the table and left her there for a few minutes while we filled out some documents. I returned to start my work and was greatly surprised to find that the bag in which we had brought her was completely turned upside down. Perhaps due to the rush of the moment, we hadn't noticed what had happened, and it was our mistake to leave her like that. I apologized and moved her to begin my work. My cousin and I opened the bag and took her out. She was very young, and we had to do some reconstruction. I was startled when, as I was about to make the incision, the young woman grabbed my arm tightly, so tightly that she left a mark that took several days to fade from my skin. Something like this had never happened to me before. It's normal for bodies to tense up, scream, or even show signs of life before we begin procedures, but never to grab you like that. Something my father taught me is that it's good to talk to them, to explain the situation they are in, and gradually, they let you work. I was held by this young lady for about five minutes. I explained what had happened and that I was there to help her reunite with her family. As the minutes passed and we continued the conversation, the strength of her grip decreased until I was able to place her hand on her side and she allowed me to begin the aspiration process. I'm accustomed to seeing many things that are quite out of the ordinary. I've reconstructed extensive parts of the face, but this person had something that wouldn't let me finish the job. It's difficult for the suction tool to get stuck, especially due to the vacuum applied by the tools we use. However, our client kept covering it up, to the point where our vacuum burned out, and we had to use another machine to continue the procedure. There were moments when the lights in the place flickered. I was starting to feel very uncomfortable despite the years I had spent as a practitioner of these procedures. There was a moment when I had to place a sheet over her face because I thought her reflexes or nervous system were still active due to the shock or the way she had left this world. She kept blinking while I finished emptying her body. For me, this was gradually becoming very disturbing. My cousin, who had accompanied me in the funeral home for many years, was already quite nervous. He was sweating and his hands were trembling when it came time to thread the needle to close the openings. It was a very challenging, tiring, and terrifying job. We placed her in her casket and began preparations to transport her to the capital city, which was about a three-hour journey. She would be buried there after the wake. We were already somewhat tired, so I told my cousin that we should go take a bath, have something to eat, and return as soon as possible to finish this service. We arrived again and loaded the casket onto the hearse to embark on our short but utterly chilling journey along the highway. I turned on the unit, and a few minutes later, we found ourselves in the middle of nowhere, in complete darkness, with only the hearse's lights on the road. Over the years, I had become accustomed to transporting our clients, but this was different. The atmosphere was filled with fear, and occasional waves of fear would come over us during the journey. I remember that just as we passed the community of Santa Rita Cotaxtla, the hearse suddenly completely shut off. It's an area surrounded by large trees that added to the darkness of the road. 
We couldn't see anything at all. I pulled over and asked my companion to get out and use a red cloth we had to signal in case a car or bus approached at high speed. I got out to check if something had malfunctioned in the engine, but everything seemed to be in perfect order. There were no fluid leaks, no smell of antifreeze, the fan belt was intact, and I also checked the battery in case it had failed, but everything seemed to be functioning fine. I remembered what my father used to say at that moment, trust your intuition, pay close attention when you're working with people who are no longer here. They may not be able to speak to you, but they can communicate through what you feel. And that's when something completely chilling happened to me. I closed the hood and got back into the hearse, my heart pounding so loudly that I could feel my own pulse through the white shirt I was wearing that night. Nowadays, hearses have a partition between the driver and the rear section, but it wasn't like that before. You could turn around and see the deceased person in their place. The little I could see was the front part of the casket because the moon was barely shining that night. My intuition was telling me that this young woman, for no reason at all, didn't want to leave this plane of existence. Right from the beginning, many completely abnormal things had been happening. I took a deep breath and asked her directly, you don't want to go, do you, young lady? I continued explaining what had happened and that her family was waiting for her in the capital. Suddenly, I heard two loud knocks coming from the casket. It shouldn't have been possible, but it happened. I was beginning a conversation with the spirit of that young woman, which, aside from leaving me speechless, sent shivers down my spine. She didn't want to leave this plane. I'll never forget how tightly I gripped the steering wheel as I recited the Hail Mary. In my life, after the cosmetic and chemical procedures, no one had communicated with me in such a way. I was on the verge of running out of the hearse, but I tried to put myself in the shoes of that girl. Nobody wants to depart, especially in the way she had. I began to explain that her whole family was waiting for her, that her parents were suffering greatly from what had happened, and I started to say, a few hours ago, your mother came to see me to help you. She told me that you were traveling in a taxi, and unfortunately, you had a fatal accident with a bus. I arrived to take you home, the same person whose arm you grabbed tightly, and I've noticed that it's very difficult for you to realize what happened. Those blinks and the flickering of the lamps while I was working tell me that you don't want to leave. I promised her that if she allowed me to reach the capital, I would talk to her mother and have her explain how things went and, above all, reassure her that everything would be alright. My entire body shivered when, out of nowhere, there was one final loud knock, clearly coming from the casket. It was all so shocking to me that when the noise dissipated into the sounds of the night and the local animals, the small courtesy light returned, and the dashboard of the hearse lit up again. I turned the key a bit more, and as if it were a scene from a horror movie, the vehicle started. A few seconds later, my cousin arrived and asked me where the problem was. To avoid frightening him, I told him that a cable at the top of the accelerator had come loose. Possibly, I had accidentally separated it with the tip of my shoe, causing the hearse to shut down completely. He settled into his seat quite calmly, and we were in the middle of nowhere without any signal to communicate with the funeral home. What had always concerned U.S. was providing good service, and to this day, we haven't let our clients down, thank God. Throughout the journey, I didn't forget the promise I had made to the young woman who was with us. I felt indebted to her. When we arrived at the house where the service would take place, I immediately told the lady some things. Of course, I didn't tell her what I'm confessing here, but I asked her to talk to her daughter and, if she had any unfinished business or something to say, to reassure her that everything would be fine. She did just that, but everything changed when her fiancé arrived at the place. He was devastated like everyone else, and his grief was so overwhelming that we had to support him when he fainted. A couple of hours passed, and it was 3.30 in the morning. I want to emphasize that, due to strange circumstances and experiences in the funeral home, this hour should not be given as dark a connotation as it has been, because not only malevolent spirits manifest themselves. Everyone was left astonished when the pedestal on which the casket was placed suddenly creaked and bent at two corners. We thought it might have been because someone leaned on it too hard, but there was no one in front of it. Those things are built to withstand a lot, so it was another sign that the young woman would do everything possible to stay among us. 
I immediately called the eldest member of the funeral home to ask what was happening, and he repeated the same thing, that young lady doesn't want to leave. He asked me about the whole situation, and I went into the hearse for a moment to tell him everything that had happened and what was happening at that moment. My grandfather confirmed that it was indeed because of that. He asked me to discreetly approach and supposedly adjust the casket with the help of my cousin. If, for some reason, the weight of the casket had drastically increased, he told me to respectfully ask her fiancé to do his best to stop crying because it was making her departure difficult. He suggested that if he wanted her to rest in peace, he should do so. After hanging up the call, I asked my companion to help me adjust the pedestal. Even though it was already bent and couldn't be straightened, we managed to place some thick wooden splinters to support it, and that's how we left it. However, I was very surprised that when we lifted the casket, it felt twice as heavy. My grandfather was right. The love these people felt for her was so strong that the young woman didn't want to leave. I managed to have a conversation with the family, explaining what was happening. They themselves went to press on the casket, and the father and the fiancé were quite surprised and bewildered. It was a slender young woman who weighed around 65 to 70 kilograms, but what they pressed corresponded to a person weighing 100 or 120 kilograms, something completely inexplicable and, above all, terrifying. I told the fiancé to say his goodbyes and express all his feelings, but, above all, to make her understand that she had to go to a better existence. He needed to explain why she had to leave and that he would always carry her in his heart. Someday, he would see her in the afterlife, and he shouldn't worry because everything would be fine. Then, I told him that despite all the pain I knew he felt, he should calm down so his fiancée could rest and depart in peace. It might seem impossible to a certain extent, but when it was time to lift the casket and take it to its final resting place, the weight was completely different from what we had pressed during the early hours of the morning. We finished that service deep in thought. Once again, we were able to confirm that energies exist, and somehow, the deceased seek ways to communicate with us. I have many more experiences that I would love to share, but I'm not sure if these kinds of topics interest you. I would like to hear your feedback, so please give this a thumbs up if you'd like me to start writing a second part of my experiences as a funeral director. Thank you for listening.